Hello everyone, this lecture is going to be covering uh, the first part of the material from chapter 12 of your Merib text on the central nervous system. Um, the central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord, right? The organs found in your dorsal body cavity. Um, and a lot of the material in this chapter is just covering, like, anatomy of these different structures, which you're going to cover a lot in lab. Um, so this lecture, I really want you guys to focus on kind of the functions of these different brain areas, okay? So don't stress out too much about anatomy because, again, um, I think that's more important for lab. Um, but for lecture purposes, focus on the functions of the different brain regions, um, and how they kind of work together to form processes. Okay, and also, I just want to point out that we are staying very surface level here. <laughs> um, there is a lot of information that we could talk about in the central nervous system. There's entire classes um, devoted to teaching this kind of stuff. Um, so we're just going to stay really basic um, just get a general overview of some really important parts. We're not going to talk about every part of the brain um, or every function. But if you're interested um, in this type of thing, like I said, there are classes. I taught a neuropsychology class, physiological psychology, um, and there's a, a lot of different classes. So if you're interested, let me know, and I can either recommend some classes, or if you're interested in the neuroscience major, that was my major back in the day. So I'd be happy to talk to anyone about the nervous system, because I like this stuff a lot, okay? All right, let's get started. So um, starting with the brain, um, sorry, again, the spinal cord, I'm not really going to cover in this lecture either. Um, so the anatomy, again, you're going to cover in lab, and also the reflex arc, um, you're going to be covering in lab, so I'm not going to worry about it in lecture, okay? Especially the summer session, we're just, I'm trying to keep things kind of a little bit more simple um, for lecture. Okay, so we're just going to talk about the brain. Um, adult brains have four main regions, your cerebral hemispheres, which are like the outside parts of the brain that you like think of when you think of the brain, the wrinkly superficial region. The diencephalon, which is deep on the inside to the cerebral hemisphere, so kind of like in the middle of the brain, the core of the brain, if you will. You have the brain stem, which connects the brain to the spinal cord, consists of a few different areas, midbrain, pons, medulla. Um, and then finally, a structure card called the cerebellum, which is found on the back side, kind of underneath the brain. Um, it's a little hind brain and mini brain behind your actual brain. Okay, so we'll talk about all of these regions. Um, there are different structures found in each and then the functional um, functionality of these different areas of the brain. Okay, but before we do that, I want to um, talk about the meninges. So the mening meninges are the membrane found in the dorsal body cavity. Okay. So in an earlier chapter, we talked about um, the serous membranes, right? Those double-walled, you have the visceral and parietal pleural pericardium uh, peritoneum in your ventral body cavity. In your dorsal body cavity, you don't have that double-layered membrane, a serous membrane. Instead, you have meninges. So meninges um, are there to cover and help protect the central nervous system, um, they kind of encase blood vessels to help protect blood vessels um, and enclose venous sinuses. They contain cerebral spinal fluid, which we'll talk about. We talked about that when we talked about the ependymal cells, the glial cells. Um, and they also form these different like partitions in the skull. So they kind of hold just everything in place and help protect um, the brain. So there's three layers that you're going to have to know, and you should know the order of them. So most superficially is the dura mater, um, which in here, there's two different layers, but this whole thick outer layer is the dura mater. Your arachnoid mater is kind of in the middle, and if you ever see anything um, that kind of looks like spider webby, that's going to be the arachnoid mater. Okay, I think arachnoid spider. And then um, the deepest layer closest to the brain is the pia mater. Okay, and on the, the pia mater is going to be like on the very, very surface of the brain. 
Okay, so all those little ridges and grooves, the pia mater is going to go over directly touching the entire surface of the brain. Okay, so those are the meninges. Again, they're not serous membranes. You don't have the serous fluid. Um, they have specialized functions specifically to help the brain itself. Okay, all right. Back to talking about the actual brain. So in the brain and spinal cord, um, you're going to have gray matter and white matter. And we talked about last chapter, some neurons are going to be myelinated and some are going to be unmyelinated, non-myelinated. And I mentioned that non-myelinated neurons make up gray matter and myelinated makes up white matter. Okay, so uh, the myelin in the white matter... Kind of the myelin is like a, that fatty insulation covering the axon of a neuron that makes it kind of look white. So when you have the white matter, that's telling you it's myelinated um, neurons. And the gray matter um, is going to be non-myelinated neurons, but mostly cell bodies. Okay, so the parts of the neurons that are not the axons. Okay, um, and in our brain, starting on the right side here, you can see that you have gray matter is superficial in the brain and white matter is deep in the brain. Okay, so you can see the gray matter superficial all along the outside of the brain, right? And then the white matter is going to be deep in the brain. Okay, which means inside the brain here, these are all myelinated axons running through the brain. And then the cell bodies and non-myelinated axons are going to be closer to the surface. We also have, you'll see some gray matter deep in the brain, and those are different nuclei. And we're going to talk about some of those. Um, there are, you know, little pockets of nuclei of gray matter deeper in the brain. Um, and in the spinal cord, it's opposite. So in the spinal cord, um, white matter is superficial and gray matter is deep. Okay, so if I zoom in, again... This is a cross section through the spinal cord here, like a transverse section. So this butterfly looking shape in the middle, which we'll talk about in lab more, all that deep there is gray matter. And then the funiculi, more superficially, the white matter um, is more superficial. Okay. So the gray matter and white matter are flip-flopped in the brain and spinal cord. Okay. All right. Also within the brain, there are these spaces that are filled with the cerebrospinal fluid. So we talked about the ependymal cells, which are the neuroglial cells that produce cerebrospinal fluid. And they have the little cilia on the top that help um, circulate CSF through the brain. So where those are found and where this is happening is within these ventricles. Okay, so the ventricles are fluid-filled chambers that are continuous to one another and connect the central canal of the spinal cord. So you'll see within the brain itself, there are a number of different ventricles. You have the lateral ventricles um, on either side, kind of like horns, the third ventricle in the middle here, fourth ventricle down by the cerebellum, and that is continuous with the central canal, which runs through the middle of the spinal cord. Okay. And all of these are going to be lined with those ependymal cells that are creating and circulating that cerebral spinal fluid. And that CFF, CSF is really important to um, bring nutrients to the brain. Okay, so the CSF is actually made from filtering our blood plasma. So it takes the nutrients out of our blood, brings it to the brain, um, brings oxygen to the brain, and um, also is there to help protect the brain. So it's kind of like an extra little cushion um, that can protect the brain, okay? And there's also going to be CSF around the outside of the brain um, in those spaces between the men meninges, um, but protect the brain and bring nutrients to the brain is CSF, uh, and the ventricles and names of them you're going to have to know more um, in lab, okay? So now back to the brain again. So the cerebral hemispheres are the first part of the brain we're going to be talking about, um, they account for about 83% of the brain mass, and they're the most superior part of the brain. So it's the most superficial, kind of wrinkly pink stuff that you're going to see, right? All of this stuff on the surface of the brain are your cerebral hemispheres, okay? Um, you're going to see, again, those little ridges and grooves, and those actually have 
um, special names. So anytime you see, so I'm going to just draw. So if this is the brain down here, right, and we see ridges and grooves <laughs> like this, right, anytime we see a ridge at the top, that's going to be called a gyrus. So this top part is a gyrus. If you zoom in here, all of these top kind of squiggly parts, those are all going to be gyri. Okay. We also have parts of the brain um, that are the grooves, and those are going to be sulci. So in the groove mm -hmm. is a sulcus. Okay. So gyri are the ridges, mm -hmm. the grooves are sulci. Mm -hmm. So in each one, all of these like mm -hmm. grooves, those are all technically sulci. Okay. We also have a third type of surface marking called a fissure, which is just going to be a really deep sulcus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they're going to be found um, in a few different places in the brain. The main one is going to be mm -hmm. the longitudinal fissure, which is separating your two hemispheres. So this big, deep groove right mm -hmm. between the two hemispheres is the longitudinal mm -hmm. fissure. Again, a fissure because it's just mm -hmm. a deep groove. Longitudinal because that's the directions it's running in. Mm -hmm. um, and transverse cerebral fissure, fissure, you can't see in this picture, but I think... Yep. Transverse cerebral fissure is the groove that's going to separate your cerebrum, this top part of your brain, from the cerebellum, this bottom part of your brain. Okay. So we use these surface markings um, in order to separate different parts of the brain. Um, they kind of tell us where we're at in the brain, and we're, it helps us separate the different lobes, Okay, which I'll show on the next slide. Okay, so we're going to have some specific names of gyri, sulci, and fissures that are just going to tell us a little bit more about the area we're looking at. Okay, so like I said, we have our transverse fissure separating our cerebrum and cerebellum. Um, this area here is going to be our central sulcus, which is a really important one, which is going to separate our frontal lobe. Whoops, I wanted to do this one. Our frontal lobe up front from our parietal lobe, kind of top middle. Um, we have our, this guy here is our lateral sulcus. which is separating um, this lobe here, which is the temporal lobe from the other ones. Um, and then um, our occipital lobe. Don't worry about any of the sulci back there. Okay, so frontal lobe, parietal, occipital, and temporal. Um, obviously, the cerebrum is up top and the cerebellum is on the bottom there. Okay, there's another... Um, lobe of our brain that we can't actually see. Um, and if we were to cut through this kind of um, lateral sulcus here, just do a cut through there and pull the temporal lobe down and the frontal lobe up, we'd see a more internal lobe of the brain. Um, and that lobe is called the insula. So you can see here, deep inside of that lateral sulcus, we have the insula. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's something that you can't easily see with the eye, um, but is another lobe that you're going to have to know. Okay, there definitely will be a quiz question on that. Okay, so our cerebral cortex, those, that most superficial part of our brain that makes up the cerebral hemispheres, is kind of the executive site of the brain. So it's the site of conscious mind. Okay, so all your higher order thinking um, and cognition is going to be happening within the cerebral cortex itself. So things like awareness, different sensory perceptions, motor initiation, communication, memory storage, understanding, anything that's, you know, a higher level thinking is going to be happening within the cerebral cortex. Okay, and it's going to be happening in different areas. So you can see in the image, um, this is looks like a fMRI scan, maybe. Um, I should have written that down. I think it's an fMRI scan, some sort of brain scan. And the areas that have blood flow to them when people are doing different activities are going to light up in an fMRI scan.
Oh, this might be a PET scan. I can't remember. Whatever. So, and people are work, are using their brain to look at things. You see an area in the back of the brain, the occipital lobe, lighting up. People are hearing, you can see an area in the temporal lobe lighting up. Speaking, um, kind of the side of the brain here by the temporal lobe. And then just thinking in general, obviously there's going to be a lot of different areas of the brain working together. Okay, but all of these higher order skills are going to activate the cerebral cortex. Okay, so the cerebral cor cortex is that thin superficial layer of just that gray matter, okay, which is going to be composed of the neuron cell bodies, dendrites, glial cells, blood vessels, but no axons. And I'm going to put here especially no myelinated. Okay, we can have some short non-myelinated axons, but no for sure myelinated axons are found within the cerebral cortex. Okay. Mm -hmm. There are four um, general considerations of the cerebral cortex. So there's three types of functional areas. We have mm -hmm. motor areas that are controlling our voluntary mm -hmm. movement, sensory areas that are mm -hmm. there for conscious awareness of sensation, mm -hmm. and areas that we call association areas, mm -hmm. which are going to be the areas that are actually integrating mm -hmm various forms of information. So integration means kind of just using the information together. So using sensory information and integrate it with other sensory information. So say we're integrating our touch information with our smell information. Okay, we're integrating those different types of information together to make sense of what's going on in our environment. Okay, each hemisphere is con concerned with contralateral, which means opposite side of the body. Okay, so if this is our, <laughs> us, <laughs> and our um, left brain, say this is the front of the person, our left brain is going to control the right side of our body, and our right brain is going to control the left side of our body. Mm -hmm. Okay, so contralateral means it's crossing over. Mm -hmm. So right side controls the left side of the body, mm -hmm. left side controls right side of the body. Mm -hmm. Okay. We also have something called a lateralization, mm -hmm. which just means kind of like specialization. Okay, so some cortical functions can only occur in, mm -hmm. can occur in only one hemisphere. Mm -hmm. Um, so we can have specific hemispheres that are responsible for doing specific tasks, okay? Mm -hmm. So we, for example, in the left side of our brain, we had a, a lot of extra areas oops, mm -hmm. for language, comprehension, mm -hmm. um, and production, mm -hmm. okay, that are only found in the mm -hmm. left side of our brain. We'll talk about some of those areas in a minute, but that's an example of lateralization, that you have one side of your brain... Mm -hmm that has, has a specific job that's different from the other side, okay? Um, and conscious behavior is going to involve the entire cortex in one way or the other, okay? So obviously just being alive, thinking, doing whatever is going to involve the entire cortex, okay? Um, so here are some of the areas we're going to be talking about. Um, again, we're going to be talking about the different motor, oops, the different motor areas, um, talking about the different sensory areas and the related association areas. Um, and then some specific areas um, within sensory for different uh, things. So we have somatic sensation, taste, equilibrium, vision, hearing. Um, so we're going to be talking about all these areas and their functions. Um, but it's a good idea to look at this um, kind of map of the brain. You'll be learning the general areas in lab. But it's kind of cool to make connections to some other um, more specific areas that we're going to be talking about in the lecture. Okay. So let's start by talking about um, the motor areas here. Okay. So the motor areas are going to be kind of on this top front part of the brain. Um, so it's in the front of your central sulcus. So it's going to be in your frontal lobe. Right. Your central sulcus is here. Separates your frontal lobe from your parietal lobe. Um, so your precentral gyrus is that first ridge right before the central sulcus, and that's making up your primary motor cortex. Okay, so your motor areas. 
located in the frontal lobe, mm -hmm. and they act to control voluntary movement. Okay, so all of this is going to be movement that you are actually initiating, so movement of your skeletal muscles. Okay, you have the primary motor cortex in your precentral gyrus. Your premotor cortex is just anterior to that. Broca's area is anterior to the inferior <laughs> premotor area. And then an area called the frontal eye field, um, which is within the anterior premotor cortex superior to Broca's area. So they're all, you can see them all here. Um, you can see the premotor cortex. You can't see this. The premotor cortex just in this prefrontal pre-central gyrus, mm -hmm. the premotor cortex right ahead of that, mm -hmm. um, the frontal eye field is this kind of front mm -hmm. part, and then Broca's area mm -hmm. is kind of inferior to all of those. Mm -hmm. Okay, so refer back to this image when we start talking about stuff later on, okay? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the functions of each of these areas. So the primary mm -hmm. somatic motor cortex, mm -hmm. again, is in that pre-central gyrus of the frontal lobe. It's going to be composed of cells that are called pyramidal cells. So they're large neurons that allow conscious control of precise skilled uh, skeletal muscle movements. They're going to be a type of multipolar neuron. Um, and this primary motor cortex is arranged in a um, specific way. And we call that a somatotopy where all the muscles of the body can be mapped out to a specific area in the premotor cortex. Okay, so there's a specific part of your premotor cortex that is responsible for co controlling your biceps muscle. Okay, there's a specific area that's responsible for your gastrocnemius. Okay, so your, each muscle in your body has a specific area in your brain that controls its specific movement. Okay, and we can call this... Uh, layout the motor homunculi um, which if you look on this image here there's like an upside down character, character, caricature that represents the contralateral motor innervation of body regions okay so again um, the um, left side of our body is going to control our right our left side of the brain is going to control the right side of the body um, well that would be this is backwards. This is anterior. So this would be the right side of the brain is controlling the left side of the body, right? And the left side of the brain is controlling the right side of the body, vice versa. But within that um, precentral gyrus, you can see there's different areas that are controlling different parts of our body. So all of the parts in our body are mapped out. So there's a region that's controlling movement of our toes, uh, foot, knee, hip, trunk, shoulder, arm, elbow, wrist, hand, fingers, thumb, and neck, eyebrows, eyes, face, lips, jaw, tongue, and then our throat for swallowing. All right, so there's a specific area in our brain controlling all of this. And you can see that um, things like our fingers that have more fine um, ability to movement, you can move them, discriminate movement a lot better. But a lot better control of movement in our fingers compared to like our hip. There's a bigger area in our cortex devoted to our hand and finger movements than our hip movement, right? Because we need a higher fine-tuned movement for that area, okay? Our lips, we have a lot of different ways we can move them. Our mouth talking, um, so there's going to be more representation for that area in our body, in our, pre in our motor cortex, um, because we need, again, that kind of fine-tuned um, movement there, okay? A lot of times, if individuals have a stroke, you'll see they have um, some sort of paralysis, and a lot of times, it'll be just kind of maybe one side of their body, and that's because if they have a stroke, it's going to damage tissue in a specific area of the brain. So say the person has a stroke, and it damages tissue in this area of the right side of this motor cortex, okay? That is going to control the muscles of their face on the left side of their body, okay? So depending on where you see kind of a local paralysis on their body, you can determine really where the stroke um, happened in their brain, okay? So the damage, the paralysis you're going to see in the body is happening on the opposite side um, from the damage, okay? 
Mm. Um, and a stroke isn't isn't damaging mm. like the muscle strength or the muscle's ability to perform mm. different movements. It's just damaging the control over that movement within the brain. Okay. Um, sometimes if this happens, um, you can work and kind of uh, reprogram the neurons to um, take over the skill of the damaged neurons. So if this area of the brain is damaged and the person lost control of their left um, eye, say that's very localized, these nearby neurons will actually reprogram themselves and take over that function so you can regain the function. So the neurons that um, died or were damaged aren't necessarily being replaced or fixed, but other areas of the brain are going to start taking over and making up for um, those damaged neurons. Okay. And it's also interesting. There's been studies done. Um, individuals who, like, for example, like play piano and use their fingers more, or musicians, they're going to have a lot larger area of their brain um, that represents the motor control of their fingers because they're using their fingers more. Okay. If we have a patient who is an amputee, the area for their fingers and hands is going to not be used. So it's going to start taking over and doing a different job. Okay. So our brain is what we call plastic. It has plasticity. Plasticity, which means the different neurons in our brain, although they have a specific function, if they're not being used or like you are amputated, you have an amputation of your arm and those motor um, neurons involved in controlling our arm movement aren't being used, they're going to find a different job. They're going to start working on maybe um, our shoulder or they're going to go over and start working on our face movements, right? Because they don't want to just be sitting there and doing nothing. They're going to keep working. Okay, I'll stop talking about this. So that's the primary motor cortex. We also have the premotor cortex, which is anterior to the primary motor cortex. The premotor cortex is really important in planning movements. Okay, so if you're thinking about a movement you're going to do, it's kind of like the staging area for those skilled motor activities. So if we have some sort of learned, repetitive, or patterned motor skill, something like, um, you know, opening a can of pop, okay? When you're doing that, the first time you open a can of pop, it might not be very a skilled movement, but it's repetitive. We, you come up with this kind of pattern, a sequential action where you grab the pop, your other hand goes to the top, you put your finger under the little uh, tab, you pull up on the tab, push it down, you know, yada, yada, yada. After doing that a certain number of times, that's those sequential actions are kind of saved within the premotor cortex. So then the next time you go to open a can of pop, those that sequence of movements is saved. So you don't have to think about it and your movement ends up being smoother. Okay. Um, the premotor cortex also controls voluntary actions that depend on sensory feedback. So some of our muscle movements um, depend on feeling something in space. You know, if you're moving your hand towards something based on touch, um, our premotor cortex is going to be responsible for controlling those types of movements. Okay. A few other motor areas. Broca's area um, is an important one. Typically, Broca's area is going to be lateralized, which means it's present only in one hemisphere, and it's usually going to be the left side. Broca's area is your motor speech area um, that directs muscles specifically used in speech production. Okay, so it's a very specialized area of motor movement, but motor movement directly relating to spe speech. <laughs> So it's active in both planning speech and during um, actual speech itself, okay? Um, so we'll talk about this a little bit later. We'll talk about language as a whole. And then the last motor area is the frontal eye field, um, which is going to be controlling voluntary eye movement. So if you're moving your eyes around to look at something or focus on something in the distance, focusing on something more close, the frontal eye field will be active, Okay, and it makes sense that we have these specific regions that are involved in more specific tasks um, because things like language, our muscles of speech production, and our eye muscles are a lot more fine tuned than all the other muscles in our body. 
right? They t- are going to take a lot of brain power to control, um, which is why there are specific areas that are devoted to controlling them. Okay? So those are our motor areas. Next, we have our sensory areas. Okay? All sensory er- areas of the cortex... Oh, sorry. Sensory areas are areas of the cortex that are concerned with conscious awareness of different sensations. Okay? So they're in the parietal lobe, insular lobe, temporal, and occipital. So everywhere except for the frontal lobe. And there's going to be eight main areas that we'll talk about. Our primary somatosensory cortex, somatosensory association cortex, visual areas, auditory areas, the vestibular cortex, olfactory cortex, gustatory cortex, and the visceral sensory area. Okay, so a lot of different um, places here involved in sensation. So let's start by talking about our primary somatosensory cortex. Our primary somatosensory cortex is in the post-central gyrus of the parietal lobe. Right, so remember our central sulcus separates our frontal and our parietal. And right in front of the central sulcus, we have our precentral gyrus, which is our primary motor cortex. Behind the central sulcus, we have our postcentral gyrus, which is our um, primary somatosensory cortex. Okay. Our primary somatosensory cortex receives sensory information from skin and proprioceptors of skeletal muscle joints and tendons. Proprioceptors are specialized um, sensory receptors that um, help you feel where you are at, in, like in space. So it feels um, where your arms are at in relation to the rest of your body. Um, your primary somatosensory cortex is capable of sensory or spatial discrimination. Um, so it, it can identify um body regions that are being stimulated so we know what specific area of our body is being touched you know if we're being touched we have that fine discrimination where we can feel that exact spot okay and like the motor primary motor cortex our primary somatosensory cortex is also divided into a homiculus but this time a somatosensory homiculus so again, different areas of the body have different representation in the somatosensory region um, of your brain. Okay. So again, areas that have more sensation are going to have a larger um, area um, of representation on the brain. Again, going to be laid out in a way um, that you know shows the relative amount of sensory receptors in each area. And what's kind of interesting is that your genitals are right by your toes in your sensory cortex, um, which is some studies have been done that show that that's sometimes maybe why people like their toes getting sucked on, like as a sexual thing, because <laughs> um, your toes are so close to your genitals that stimulation of your toes actually can activate some neurons maybe that overlap with your genitals there. Um, so it can have that sexual pleasure feeling which is kind of interesting all right your somatosensory association cortex is posterior to the primary somatosensory cortex and this association cortex again is going to associate stuff so it's integrating sensory input from the primary cortex for understanding of the object okay so it's taking just basic sensory information and kind of letting us perceive it and understand what it is so it determines the size, texture, and relationship of parts between objects being felt. Okay, so it's allowing us, um, when we're feeling something like, say you're touching an apple, but you're blindfolded, so you can't see the apple, um, but you're feeling somatosensation of the apple, um, the somatos- somatosensory association cortex is taking all of that tactile information and integrating it so we can figure out what that object actually is okay the next sensory area are our visual areas so we have our primary visual cortex or the striate cortex is on the very posterior tip of the occipital lobe most is buried in this sulcus called the calcarine sulcus which is just a little sulcus on the back of 
um, the occipital cortex. And the primary visual cortex is just receiving information from the retinas. So that visual information is sent to the primary visual cortex. And then we have visual association areas that are going to surround the primary visual cortex. And they are going to actually interpret the visual stimuli. Okay, And they do that by using past visual experiences to take the information from the retina, from the primary visual cortex, and make sense of it. Okay, so it looks at color, form, movement of the um, visual cues, um, and is taking that, and like the um, somatosensory association areas, it's going to take that information and kind of understand what's going on. So, for example, our ability to recognize faces is due to our visual association areas. Okay, so we see the faces with our primary visual cortex, um, but without our visual association areas, we wouldn't be able to actually identify that what we're looking at is a face, right? We would just see a blob, but we wouldn't be able to actually perceive that or make sense of it, okay? Um, so this complex processing involves the entire posterior half of the cerebral hemispheres. So understanding and recognizing objects that we are seeing it involves uh, the posterior part of the, our brain, our cerebral hemisphere, so most of our occipital lobes. Okay. If we have damage to the primary visual cortex, that's resulting in blindness. Okay, so we can't see. Okay. If we have damage to the visual association areas, we can people would still be able to see, but they couldn't comprehend what they're actually looking at. Okay. So you can see something, but you can't understand what you're looking at, which is really weird to think about. Um, you know, still being able to see but not being able to comprehend or understand that what you're looking at is a tree or what you're looking at is a face or understanding whose face is who, right? Kind of weird. All right, auditory areas, same thing as the other sensory areas. You're going to have a primary auditory cortex and auditory association areas. The primary auditory cortex is on the superior side of the temporal lobes. It is... Um, interpreting information from the ear as pitch, loudness, and location, so hearing um, different parts of a sound. The association areas are posterior to the primary areas, and the auditory association areas are storing memories of sound and permitting perception of the sound stimulus. So it's taking sounds and allowing us to um, actually understand what we're hearing. So if you hear a bird chirp, you have memories of bird chirps before. Even if, say, it's a specific type of bird, you are a bird watcher and you're hearing um, a cardinal chirp, our auditory association area allows us to hear the chirp, understand that it's a chirp and recognize that chirp, and then even further recognize what type of bird is chirping. Okay. So again, if we have damage to our primary auditory cortex, we wouldn't be able to hear, okay? If we have damage to our auditory association areas, we'd be able to hear stuff, but we wouldn't be able to, you know, perceive or recognize anything that we hear, which again is really weird to think about, okay? We also have our vestibular cortex, which is the posterior part of the insula, um, and the adjacent parietal cortex. All of these are shown in that first um, brain I showed you too. Our vestibular cortex is responsible for conscious awareness of balance. Um, so our position of head in space. So knowing that you're standing straight up or that you're not straight up is the vestibular cortex. Um, so our balance is really what the vestibular cortex um, is. Um, responsible for. And then we have our olfactory cortex. The primary olfactory cortex is responsible for smell, which is in the medial side of your temporal lobes. Um, yeah, we don't worry about the second part. Um, so the olfactory cortex is interesting because um, this part of the brain the Ryan Cephalon um, is 
associated with the olfactory cortex, but also discriminates and becomes part of the limbic system. Um, so the olfactory cortex is involved in the conscious awareness of odors. This is what you really need to know here. Um, but because it's kind of associated with the limbic system, which we'll talk about later on, um, smells are kind of like a trigger for emotional feelings. Our limbic system controls emotions. And because the limbic system and the olfactory cortex are associated with this rhinencephalon, um, a lot of the, the odors that we smell are really good at activating our limbic system and activating some sort of emotional response. Okay, so you can have different smells that bring back like happy memories if you smell like lilacs. That's like a happy <laughs> smell to me. Um, it's because of this kind of connection between um, the olfactory cortex and the limbic system. Okay. And then I think just two more here. Oh, just kidding. Not two more. We have the association area stuff. We have our gustatory cortex, which is in the insula, deep to the temporal lobe, which is involved in the perception of taste. So um, gustation is the taste happening. Um, and then the visceral sensory area is posterior to the gustatory cortex and is involved in the perception of visceral sensations. So remember, visceral, think of your visceral organs. So things as an upset stomach or full bladder um, is perceived in the visceral sensory areas. Okay. So those are all of our sensory areas, our main sensory areas. But then we also have multimodal association areas. Okay, so we had our, um, our visual cortex and then our visual association areas. That's going to be associating different visual information together. Multimodal association areas are receiving input from multiple sensory areas and integrating a bunch of different information together. So you can be taking visual information, um, smell information, uh, tactile information, all the different types of information and integrating it to kind of get a bigger picture of what's going on in our environment. Okay, it's also going to be sending output to multiple different areas. Um, so it allows us to give meaning to information received, store it in our memory and tie to previous experience. Um, which allows us to decide on actions. So these are going to be like the main integration areas in our brain. Okay, we're able to receive memories um, from the past, tie those memories to what we're perceiving currently with our smell, our taste, our where our body's at, and allows us to integrate all that information together and make an action. So it's kind of the connection between our sensory um, areas and our motor areas. So sensations, thoughts, and emotions become conscious, um, and they make us who we are, okay? So our multimodal association areas are divided into three parts, which we'll talk about all of these. Anterior association area, posterior association area, and the limbic association area. So first, our anterior association area is called the prefrontal cortex, um, it's the most complicated in the cortical region. A prefrontal cortex does a lot of shit. So it's involved in intellect, cognition, recall, and personality. Um, so a lot of the major things <laughs> here. Um, it contains working memory needed for planning abstract ideas, um, judgment, reasoning, persistence. Um, so all of like the things that make us uniquely human are in that prefrontal cortex. Okay, um, the development of this area depends on feedback from our social environment. Um, so as we get older, our prefrontal cortex is going to become more developed um, and better at planning, making judgment calls. Obviously, kids aren't very good at that. Reasoning, um, persistence. As we get older, those things become um, better and better fine-tuned. If you have damage to the anterior association area, this prefrontal cortex... Um, all of these things are going to be impacted, but you can have damage to even just a specific area that's going to affect your personality. Um, so if you've heard of a famous person back in the day called Phineas Gage, 
he had a uh, railroad spike lodged through his head and it um, impaled him in the prefrontal cortex. And he was completely fine, even though they, I should have put a picture of this in here. Um, completely fine. But he, like, his, his personality just completely changed. Um, so that railroad spike that was lodged through his entire head, it, like, went through his eye socket, I think. Um, all it did was change his personality um, because it, you know, hit that spot in his prefrontal cortex involved in that. Okay. Um, if someone has a tumor in this area of their brain or some other sort of lesion or damage, um, again, it's going to affect all these things. You can have a personality disorder, um, loss of judgment. Um, the uh, individual may be oblivious to certain social restraints. Um, so they'll maybe stop caring about their personal appearance or start taking more risks. They have bad judgment, um, that type of thing. Okay. The next type association areas are the posterior association area and the limbic association area. Posterior association area is a large region in the temporal, parietal, and occipital lobes, so in the backside of our brain. Um, it plays a role in recognizing patterns and faces, um, in localizing us in space. It's also involved in oops, understanding written and spoken language. So um, there's an area called Wernicke's area, which we'll talk about when we talk about language later on. That is a part of this posterior association area. Um, our limbic association area is part of the limbic system. It involves the cingulate gyrus, perhippocampal gyrus, and the hippocampus, which we'll talk about later. And it provides emotional impact that makes us a uh, scene important to us and helps us establish memory. Um, so it takes something that we're looking at and kind of creates the importance of it to us, right? So um, things like 9-11, where you have a very emotional response to watching that. Um, if you were, um, I remember I was in like, I don't remember, what, second grade, third grade. And we like literally watched it on TV. <laughs> um, and so our, my memory, the emotions that I had while watching that, the limbic association area um, kind of coupled that visual memory of watching this happen on TV with the emotional memory, you know, of like, holy shit, what's going on? And made that memory a lot more important and really established that memory in my brain. Okay, so it kind of controls um, these really emotional memories, I guess, for us. Okay. All right. In our brain, I mentioned it earlier, but we have a lateralization of cortical function. Um, so lateralization is the division of labor between our hemispheres, which means our hemispheres are not identical. Okay, so again, like our left side of our brain has some more specialized area involved in language that you don't see on the right. Okay, um, so this is known as cerebral dominance. So the hemisphere that is dominant for language. So about 90% of humans have left side dominance. Um, and this type of dominance usually results in the person being right-handed. Because right? if the left side of the brain is a bit more active, a bit more complex, our left um, pr uh, primary motor cortex is going to control the right side of our body. So our right hand is going to be a bit more fine-tuned. Okay, And about 10% uh, of people, the roles of the hemispheres are reversed. So in some, not all, but some left-handed people, you'll actually see that their right side of the brain has those um, that cortical dom dominance and has those specialized language areas. Okay, so it's kind of interesting. Not all left-handed people have this flip-flop in their brain. Some of them still technically have the left cerebral dominance, um, but some individuals do have their dominant brain switched around, which is kind of weird. Okay, um, so although we have different areas of our brain controlling different things, like our left hemisphere is controlling language, math, logic mostly, our right hemisphere, visual spatial skills, intuition, emotion, artistic and musical skills. So although there's kind of like the separation of um, different areas of our brain doing different things, 
our two hemispheres of our brain are communicating almost instantaneously. Okay, so there's going to be fibril tracts um, that are going to connect um, these two hemispheres of our brain and help integrate the information on both sides. Okay, so those tracts are going to be made up of cerebral white matter, which is the second of three basic regions in the hemispheres that we're going to be talking about. Um, the white matter is responsible for a communication between our cerebral areas and between the cortex and the lower parts of our central nervous system. So remember, the white matter, oh, it says it in the next bullet point, are the myelinated fibers um, of our axons bundled into large tracts. So it's going to be responsible for sending information back and forth. Okay, And this white matter can be classified in... Um, different names according to the direction that the fibers run. So there can be association fibers, commissural fibers, and projection fibers. Okay. So here, association fibers are going to be horizontal running fibers that connect different parts of the same hemisphere. So you can see them in red down here. Um, so they're going to be just housed within each hemisphere. Um you know, connecting parts of the brain on the same side. Commissural fibers are horizontal fibers that connect gray matter of two hemispheres. So you'll see here commissural fibers. So an area called the corpus callosum is a white matter tract that connects the two hemispheres of our brain. So it's going to be running right down the middle, connecting the right and left hemisphere. And then we have the projection fibers, which are going to be vertical fibers that connect the hemispheres with lower brain and spinal cord. Okay, so our projection fibers, um, we have the corna radiata, internal capsule. Um, they're going to be going between the white matter to the cortex or to the, from the cortex to the brain stem, depending on which one we're looking at. Okay, so those are the different types of fibers. Again, Association fibers are the pink ones in this image that are just going within um, a hemisphere. Commissural fibers are connecting the hemispheres together, right? So in this example, we see our corpus callosum connecting our left and our right hemisphere. Um, we have our projection fibers also that are connecting our cortex to our lower area. So it's going to be going from our cortex to our brain stem um, or from our cortex to our other deeper white matter, thalamus, things like that. Okay. Um, and then the third of the three basic regions of our cerebrum are our basal nuclei or our basal ganglia. Okay. Um, and these are going to be deep to the gray matter. They're going to be these little nuclei on the inside of our um, uh, cerebrum. And they're going to, there's going to be three nuclei, caudate nucleus, putamen, and the globus pallidus. Okay? Um, the caudate nucleus and putamen also can be bunched together and called the striatum. Okay, but those three nuclei make up our basal nuclei. Um, and they are closely associated with um, sub subthalamic nuclei called the diencephalon, which we'll talk about, and the midbrain, or substantia niagara. Okay, so functions of the basal nuclei, um, they are thought to do a lot of different things. So influence muscle movements, play a role in cognition and emotion. Um, regulate the intensity of slow or stereotyped movements, so a lot of our like slow controlled movements. Filter out incorrect or inappropriate responses. Inhibit um, antagonistic or um, unnecessary movements. So a lot of different um, functions, um, and we can kind of learn what they are um, responsible for doing by looking at what happens if they are damaged. So Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease are disorders of the basal nuclei. So these um, neurons in the basal nuclei are really big um, dopaminergic neurons. So they have dopamine. Um, and when these diseases like Parkinson's disease start affecting um, these nuclei, they're um, affecting the release of dopamine. So this, these neurons aren't um, functioning like they normally would. And that's why like in Parkinson's, you see 
um, um, some shaking happening, Huntington's disease, you have some loss of um, motor movement, um, and it's all due to these, this, um, not damage, but the, uh, I guess let's just say damage, damage of these um, basal nuclei, okay? So you can see they're within the cerebral hemispheres, right? So we have the gray matter superficial, the white matter is deep, and then these nuclei, they're kind of gray inside, those are going to be these basal nuclei that we're talking about. Okay, so still part of the hemispheres, but just deep to the white matter. Okay? All right, so that's it for the first part of this lecture. Um, stay tuned for part two.